My name is Ann Naughton. I'm Senior Director of Loss Prevention and Risk Mitigation with MMCIP. And the topic today for our presentation is religious considerations in the care of the Jehovah's Witness patient bloodless medicine guidelines. Uh, I would like to introduce our speakers. Um, first of all, we have Dr. Ken Tanaka. He is a professor and division head of cardiothoracic anesthesiology here at the Medical Center, Dr. Tanaka. And we have Mr. Guy Stafford and John Johnson from the Jehovah's Witness community who have been very gracious to come here and present the religious perspective, as well as several members of their community. So welcome to all of you. And thank you for letting us use this venue to provide this education. The purpose of this presentation is to fulfill a claim filed by this particular patient that we're going to review's mother. Um, we agreed <clears throat> with our um, mediation, raise consciousness and share knowledge with the medical staff and about the importance of honoring the prohibition against the use of blood products in the treatment of members of the Jehovah's Witness faith. So that said, our objectives today are to provide a, <clears throat> excuse me, a brief overview of, surgical of a surgical Jehovah's Witness patient discuss components of bloodless medicine and describe religious considerations rela related to bloodless medicine in the care of a Jehovah's Witness patient. So we'd like to just do a brief overview of the particular case that this particular claim arose from. This gentleman was, uh, had a history of poorly controlled hypertension, congestive heart failure, chronic renal failure on renal dialysis, he presented for management of a chronic dissection of the ascending aorta and the aortic root and had severe aortic insufficiency. As mentioned, he was of the Jehovah's Witness faith and did not accept blood products or blood derivatives, but would accept albumin, cell saver, cryo, salvage, and autologous blood. And that was documented in the record. In preparation for surgery and to respect the patient's wishes, an h, &H was monitored Several h and H's were monitored closely. Epigen was administered, and he also received oral iron supplementation. He did the complex surgery was, was performed, and intraoperatively, the patient received autologous blood, albumin, cryo, DDAVP, factor seven, all in line with the patient's wishes. Initially, the patient was hemodynamically stable at the completion of the surgery, but eventually he had increased needs for vasopressors and received plasma light, albumin, and prothrombin complex concentrates. Due to the patient's continued deterioration, though, after that, a uh, there was a need for platelets. So a transfusion was given after the patient's proxy gave permission. Patient had a PEA arrest, required resuscitation, had severe right ventricular dysfunction, and was cannulated for ECMO. Following these events, the patient was treated for cardiogenic shock, anoxic brain injury, and findings compatible with embolic <coughs> infarcts on the head CT. Unfortunately, the patient's condition continued to deteriorate, resulting in death two months post-op. So the major issue that was identified in this case was failure to abide by the patient's wishes not to receive blood or blood derivatives. So now I'd like to bring up Dr. Tanaka to talk about bloodless medicine. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, and uh, my name is Ken Tanaka, and it's a great pleasure to be here and share my thoughts about uh, bloodless medicine in cardiac surgery setting. So um, for me, uh, bloodless medicine is a polaris. You know, that's something we always strive for. So this is not only for Jehovah's Witness patient, but all the cardiac patients, cardiac surgical patient, benefit from this effort. That's my belief. And transfusion obviously have some side effects and we should be always, you know, be cognizant about that. And lastly, there are multiple 
transfusion alternatives available at this, um, you know, in the 21st century. So we should be always thinking about alternatives in transfusion medicine. So first of all, you know, we have to define anemia, you know, in those who come to surgery. So obviously WHO defines it less than 13 hemoglobin for males and 12, less than 12 for females. But obviously a lot of our patients do come below these numbers and they are at risk for transfusion during and after surgery. And if you look at the cardiac, cardiac surgery patient, about one third of them have anemia, and then 20% of those have iron deficiency, which can be addressed before surgery. Now, when a hemo hematocrit goes down, um, and that increases the risk of transfusion and associated mortality and morbidity, especially uh, wound infection, you know, after cardiac surgery. So this is something we should be always considering when we take care of the patient. Uh, one of my junior faculty, Mike Mazeffi, and I have done a database study. This is a national database study of a 20,000 patient, you know, undergoing colon, colon surgery. And we found that uh, any you know, transfusion, even one or two units of transfusion are significantly associated with uh, wound infection. So in, in intra-abdominal infection as well as sepsis. So even in a relatively standardized colon surgery, the risk of transfusion exists. So you can imagine when it comes to cardiac surgery, one, two, three units of red cell can do to these patients. When we think about surgical patient, we always think that the lowest hemoglobin will happen during the surgery, and after the surgery, everything should go well if you know, interop management is good. But that's not the case. When you look at this data, the nada of hematocrit actually occurs in the ICU. That means that patients continue to bleed in the ICU, receive fluids, and potentially receive breast cell transfusion. So we should address not only intra but post-op transfusion issues. That's one of the most important points that we should learn from the case that I'm presented. So um, fortunately, Maryland State has a very good database in cardiac surgery, and we can look at the, all the institutions in Maryland who, de, who, who performs cardiac surgery, and we can look at the data. So this is a transfusion data from these institutions. There's a significant variability in the red cell transfusion between 13% up to 60%. Now, intraop transfusion goes from 4% to 59% and averages about 0.7 units. Look at post-op, it goes from 13% up to 39%. And, and when you look at the mean number of transfusion, it's actually more than intraop, almost three units of red cells given uh, post-op. So patients continue to bleed in the ICU. So we have to address that issue. Now, variability, as you can see, you know, from institution one to 10, the general trend that post op transfusion is more than intraop, but there are some institutions, you know, where intraop transfusion is much more than post op transfusion. But overall, when you have patient, those who come in with lower hematocrit get transfused. And for all the institutions, there's a good trend here that uh, the lower hematocrit and then much higher transfusion, that goes up to 90% in some institutions. So we really should address pre-op anemia you know, for those coming to uh, cardiac surgery. So I'll show you what we have done in our institution, and this is the data from 2011 through 2017. 
I joined 2014, so you know that's the date I'd like to focus. But if you look at the intra-blood usage, 2014 was about 36%. Now, uh, 2017 is 25%. So there's a definite drop in there. So we have made multidisciplinary effort to reduce intra-blood usage. So that has been shown in here. So all the product, including platelets, red cell, FFP, they are all down from 36 to 25%. Now, intra Fusion here is 17.5% uh, in 2017, but if you look at the post op transfusion, it's still higher than intra op, it's almost 29%. So, there's you know, here you can also see the uh, same trend that post op transfusion is much more than intra op transfusion. When it comes to the blood salvage, this is, uh, this is the most common thing that we do. Autologous red cell blood salvage. We often call this cell saver. Essentially, you, you collect the shed blood using anticoagulant and then spin them down and then separate red cells from other debris and then collect this in the bag so you get the concentrate of red blood cells. Now, this is acceptable for Jehovah's Witness patient because this is considered as an extension of a patient's circulation. So this is a uh, you know, common procedure that we perform in every bloodless surgery cases. Issue is that you can concentrate hemoglobin by using a cell saver, but if you look at other components, platelets, fibrinogen, they all go down, so you basically spin them out. So you lose all the coagulation components and platelets by using a cell saver. So when I get one liter of a cell saver, actually I'm not very happy because we are losing lots of platelets by uh, you know, spinning those blood. So that's not the best situation. Now, other technique is something called isovolumic hemodilution or acute normal volemic hemodilution. In this technique, what we do is we take the patient's own blood, that's autologous blood, into the bag, keep them connected to the patient for Jehovah's Witness patient, and after cardiopulmonary bypass is done, we return this blood to the patient so we can actually keep platelets fibrinogen, other coagulation factors in the bag, and then we can return the blood after the car, you know, heart-lung machine is done. So in a, a meta-analysis of this technique, there's about 0.8 units reduction in the red cell usage. These are not really Jehovah's Witness patient, but general cardiac surgical patient, and also there's a reduction in the chest tube drainage after surgery. So they are in a large database of you know, meta-analysis data, there is a sort of a good signal that this technique works in most of the cardiac surgical patients. We actually have our own experience of using this technique, and especially, you know, our patient tends to have, you know, large body size and good uh, BMI, so we could actually take a lot of, you know, autologous blood from these patients. So this is a recently published data in transfusion, but we hypothesize that more than 900 cc's of autologous blood will significantly reduce allogenic blood usage in cabbage and aortic valve surgery. So these are the data. This ANH is an autologous group versus control. Age, male percentage, about the same. 90-minute bypass, most of them were on aspirin. But you can see that intra transfusion 10% versus 35% in the control. And total transfusion 25% versus 45%. So there is a significant impact on the transfusion by using high volume autologous technique. And the most important data I'd like to show you today is by using autologous blood, you could actually reduce the blood product usage in a post-surgical period. There's a significant difference in the post-surgical period. So by having autologous blood, you essentially reduce the post-op patient's 
sort of blood loss, and therefore patients are hemodynamically more stable, and they do not receive you know, any type of transfusion after surgery. So it really increased the chance of bloodless surgery uh, in these patients. So again, you know, large database study by SDS, uh, American Society of uh, Thoracic Surgery, actually looked at the effects of autologous blood transfusion like we performed, and this is a 13,000 case. But in the nation, only about 17% of the, uh, you know, this 20, uh, 13,000 patient received uh, acute normal volemic hemodilution. So, you know, this technique is still underutilized in most of the institutions. But the effect is quite clear. You know, most of the patients who receive autologous, you know, blood transfusion are actually large body size, but, you know, the transfusion rate is quite similar to what we have observed in my institution. So significant drop in the red cell, platelets, and plasma transfusion. So these are very you know, clear signal that autologous transfusion or acute normal bulimic hemodilution is a very good technique for bloodless surgery. All right, so two techniques, cell salvage. It only recovers red cells. ANH, acute normal volemic hemodilution, you can keep all the components, red cell, platelets, fibrinogen, all the blood coagulation factors. So I'd, I'd like to show you one case here. This is the actual Jehovah's Witness patient, redo case, 43-year-old with a congenital uh, you know, cardiac surgical history, tetralogy of fallow correction at a young age. Now she needs a redo pulmonic valve replacement. So numbers are great, you know, platelet is 200,000, hemoglobin 13, she was on the epogen prior to the surgery. But if you look at the, you know, predicted risk of transfusion, she would get 80 to 100% chance of red cell transfusion. So this is a very high risk case. So even with a standard technique, I think this case will be very difficult. So what do we have to think about? So in the normal patient, we always have a red cell as an alternative or treatment for low hematocrit, pro lytic state, and then fibrinogen deficiency, reduced thrombin generation, low platelets. We have all these you know, agents to support. But in, in Jehovah's Witness patient, we have very limited support, especially for the red cell mass. So I looked at the literature, and this case is a very interesting, uh, very successful kidney pancreas transplant, and everything went well. But after surgery, patient had a splenic vein thrombosis and a bleeding and other complications. So hemoglobin goes down uh, below 6 gram per deciliter after you know, second day of surgery. So what they did was hemoglobin-based oxygen carrier. This is available for uh, compassionate usage, approved by FDA for that purpose. It essentially gives a hemoglobin mass. It says hemoglobin is in the bag, 12 to 14 gram per deciliter. It's a 250 cc bag, and a half-life is about one day. So it looks like this. This is the back. So what they did was when hemoglobin went down, they gave three shots of two units or so six units of this bag. And then when the hemoglobin was recovered to about six to seven range, and they continued to maintain patient this way. Now, this patient had methohemoglobinemia, but that was treated with methylene blue, and the hypertension was also managed. Of course, the hemoglobin scavenges nitric oxide, so that has to be treated with antihypertensives. But overall, patient did quite well and survived you know, this complication. So uh, in this particular patient, I also contacted FDA for emergency IND, investi investigational drug approval, and we obtained that, and we were able to obtain 10 bags of uh, hemoglobin-based oxygen carrier that was sent to uh, our investigational pharmacy, and we kept them prior to surgery. And we, we actually obtained a consent from patient proxy, and then we, we got ready for the surgery. 
So these are you know, potential alternatives that are available to replace some of the components in, in surgery. So I don't have to go into details, but I just want to show you that the prothrombin complex that actually is a very reasonable source for some of the factors, vitamin K dependent factors. And also we have fibrinogen available. So instead of cryoprecipitate, we could use fibrinogen concentrate to replace uh, fiber, low fibrinogen state. So here we have alternatives. And then for a low hematocrit, we have an option to use hemoglobin-based oxygen carrier. So fortunately, a medical center supports thromboelastrometry at a point of care in the operating room. So we have a protocol, we have a technicians available 24 seven for cardiac surgery, so we can quickly get the coagulation test done at the bedside. So we have all these numbers here, but I just wanna show you, depending on different numbers, we do the different things. So when th this is a fibrin specific clot formation, so this, when this goes down, we can actually use fibrinogen, now, when this big one goes down, this usually indicates low platelet, and we actually use uh, platelet transfusion for a normal patient, but for the j 4 admittance patient, we use alternatives. And lastly, we have a clotting time that will give us indication for the need for prothrombin complex concentrate for a normal patient plasma transfusion. We also use in this patient cerebral oxygenation monitoring, cerebral oximeter that will give the, you know, the information about oxygen state inside the frontal lobe of the brain. So we actually look at this number and then we titrated hemoglobin-based oxygen carrier. So for here, this patient hemoglobin uh, uh, the oxygenation went down, and when we gave hemoglobin-based oxygen carrier, they actually went up. And then again, when we gave this agent, the cerebral oximeter numbers went up. So not only uh, based on the hemoglobin value, we can also use other objective parameters to guide hemoglobin-based oxygen carrier. So I think this is a very important uh, information that we could use multiple data to think about the indication for a you know, hemoglobin-based oxygen carrier or even red cell transfusion for some of the other you know, patients. So thromboelastrometry was used effectively in this case, and as you can see, rewarming time, it was these numbers were abnormal, potentially indicating the coagulopathy. So in this case, we uh, preemptively acted on, on these coagulopathy. We use a prothrombin complex concentrate as well as fibrinogen concentrate. As you can see, when you give fibrinogen, this band goes up, indicating fibrinogen is being replaced. And also clotting time went from 95 to 68 minutes, uh, seconds. So that means that clotting has been improved by prothrombin complex concentrate. So by using multimodal techniques to uh, monitor the, uh, the high-risk patients, I think we can really improve the outcome of these patients. So I'll skip those but essentially showing how fast we can treat these patients. So most of the coagulation uh, treatment was done within 30, 30 minutes after the completion of cardiopulmonary bypass, and patient did not bleed much after surgery. So my proposal as an overall structure for the bloodless surgery is something like this. So we have bloodless surgery arm, and also we need to have a pre-op, a pre-op anemia management portion, and also we have to think about inpatient blood management that might span into ICU management. So that will also work closely with investigational pharmacy with regard to a hemoglobin-based oxygen carrier. And of course, we have a you know, coordinator from Jehovah's Witness, um, society, and we have a very good communication here as a center for bloodless surgery. So I think EPIC needs to have a bloodless surgery consultation, and that should list all the available components, alternative techniques. So this is just a suggestion. 
And then also data collection is important, but that's a separate issue. So anemia clinic is probably something we should also strive for, which is not um, currently uh, done you know, on a routine basis for all the cardiac surgical patients. So to summarize, I think bloodless surgery is feasible. It's a very important way to conserve red cell, non-red cell components. And I think it benefits all the patient, uh, including Jehovah's Witness patient. So preparing for post-op bleeding is important. I think hemoglobin-based oxygen carrier was very useful in this particular case. And then we, as an anesthesiology uh, department, you know, we have multimodal way to monitor these patients from coagulation to oxygenation. So we have some expertise. And I think in the future, we, we really need a care coordinator who will help us communicate effectively with the patient and also with the interdisciplinary team. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Tanaka. And now Mr. Stafford and Mr. Johnson. So good afternoon. So my topic today is Jehovah's Witnesses, the medical and ethical challenge. And uh, I'd like to extend a warm welcome for all who took time out of the busy schedules to be present with us this afternoon. Um, my name is Guy Stafford, and I'm a local minister here in the Baltimore area. And I also volunteer on the Baltimore Hospital Liaison Committee for Jehovah's Witnesses, now which I will refer to throughout this presentation as the HLC. So our committee uh, graciously appreciates the invitation extended to us by Ann Norton and Dr. Galati, and I'm sure there were others involved. We appreciate that in making this uh, presentation possible. We, we, we cherish these opportunities, so we want to thank you. So just on a sort of get us started, you know, it's not uncommon to have several of our members admitted uh, at any given time to this facility. So we very much value and appreciate the excellent care uh, that we, we've received over the years uh, through this hospital. Doctors uh, in hospitals, we understand that you face the challenge of improving uh, healthcare quality, patient safety, uh, keeping abreast of all the technical advances, also keeping abreast of all the legal requirements and changes therein, while at the same time trying to control and reduce costs. So additionally, um, we see that uh, we're living in a time where there's an extremely uh, cultural diverse society, and it's no different here. And because of age, uh, upbringing, and gender, values and beliefs, uh, they differ, even, on, even among people of the same background. So we know that this uh, puts uh, doctors, they, they face a challenge on trying to, to understand uh, individual views. They try to understand individuals' backgrounds and, and the convictions of the patients. And so this also includes uh, understanding Jehovah's Witnesses as well. Now, at times, um, clinicians may find the choices of their patients somewhat hard to understand. However, when a person's actions clearly spring from their religious and moral convictions, they merit the attention of the doctor. In a general sense, Spinoza's uh, philosophical approach on life also applies to healthcare. And that is uh, understanding the religious belief of another does not require a doctor to accept or follow them. The intent of this presentation is to inform healthcare providers about the values and beliefs of patients who are Jehovah's Witnesses as they relate to their medical care. So these are the presentation's objectives. So through this discussion, we'll highlight our position on medical treatment, the hospital liaison committee network, the resources for the medical community and protocol for treating Jehovah's Witness patients. Now, regarding this first point, what is our position on medical treatment? So 
So first of all, we seek quality medical care, which is the very reason that we come to find facilities such as this one. Secondly, uh, we request the use of transfusion alternative strategies. Additionally, we've um, thought this through and these uh, decisions that Jehovah's Witnesses may make, uh, they are informed choices. We do, however, uh, refuse allogeneic blood transfusions. So Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, contrary to maybe some beliefs out there, uh, we, we cherish health and we definitely cherish life. And uh, some may have felt maybe in the past that Jehovah's Witnesses were anti-medicine and nothing can be further from the truth. Uh, we come to find institutions like this because we want the best medical treatment that's available. And so that's why we come to these facilities, uh, such as the one uh, just mentioned here, University of Maryland. And we want to receive quality medical care for ourselves and for our families. To support Jehovah's Witness patients, the HLCs, or the Hospital Liaison Committees, we provide personal assistance. Because you can imagine for a person who's under a mat of duress, uh, sometimes um, they may need a little assistance in kind of organizing their thoughts. And it should be noteworthy to mention that we don't arbitrarily put ourselves into their medical treatment. They use, they seek us out. And, and that's how we, we come to be involved in this situation. So what do we do for them? Um, well, we support the witness patient. The HLC provides personal assistance, such as in emergencies, a need, the need for a doctor referral, or to help resolve spiritual or moral questions related to their medical care. Now, to understand Jehovah's Witnesses' refusal, refusal rather, of blood transfusion, one must understand their Bible-based reason for doing so. So the view is simple. It's uncomplicated, and it's based upon the t this text, Acts 15, 20, abstain from blood. And we view this very seriously, and we view this as a command from our God and our creator. So shown here is a variety of translations. If you look at the bottom of uh, uh, the screen, a variety of translations, some used for centuries, that all read the same. But the question is, how do we understand this today? Abstain from blood. While this chart breaks down Jehovah's Witnesses' position on allogeneic blood, we refuse whole blood, including the naturally separated primary components of red cells, white cells, platelets, and plasma. But potentially acceptable are what we refer to as blood fractions that are derived from a component of blood. So potentially acceptable means this, that each individual must decide on these matters. Some of these decisions have been made in advance. Others may be made when a procedure is discussed with a physician. Therefore, it's extremely important and we encourage good communication between the doctor and the patient. So this sometimes can be confusing to the medical field, and we do understand that. You treated one Jehovah's Witness patient, he decided this. You treated another Jehovah's Witnesses, a witness, he decided that. You treated one witness, he accepted this. The other one accepted that. Well, the reality is beyond whole blood, red cells, white cells, platelets, and plasma, the decision primarily, any derivative of those primary components rests with the conscience of that patient. So we just wanted uh, uh, to point that out. So one common natural question is, uh, what about the use of a patient's own blood? Well, we take the position that preoperative autogalous uh, blood collection and storage is something that's unacceptable uh, to Jehovah's Witnesses. But now what is potentially acceptable? <coughs> Well, that means, once again, each, uh, let me back up a little bit, that, that we refuse the use of our preoperative blood or preoperative autogalous blood, better known as PAD, 
but once again, potentially acceptable uh, procedures named here, such as hemodilution, uh, hemodialysis, cardiopulmonary bypass, or the use of a heart lung machine, blood salvage, uh, these are something that's up to the individual witness patient. And once again, you may run into one witness that will accept and another witness that won't accept, but that's up to their individual conscience. So again, good communication between the doctor and the patient is vital, yet we've noticed that uh, here at uh, this facility, uh, they do an excellent job by engaging in discussions with the witness patients prior to procedures, and of course this reduces problems. So the course of treatment for witness patients may be different. Uh, however, with good planning, uh, they can, we can produce excellent uh, results. So to help those uh, who care for uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and to legally protect themselves against unwanted blood transfusions, uh, witnesses make their informed choices by carrying the document that's illustrated on this slide. And it's entitled The Durable Power of Attorney for Healthcare. Now, this is a state specific uh, signed legal document which clearly states the refusal of blood and the four primary component, components. It may also include other healthcare wishes that the patient may have, such as those discussed earlier. And it designates a healthcare agent in the event. Uh, that the individual or the witness patient cannot speak uh, for himself. Now, particularly challenging are situations involving children. And uh, we, we certainly understand that. So when faced with ethical and social issues involving children, there are several points to keep in mind when witness parents refuse to give consent uh, to tra transfuse their children. But here's a, a few points we, we truly want to highlight. And, and that is, first and foremost, you know, we love our children. We love their, our children as much as anyone else loves their children. And, and we seek good prenatal care, and we work extremely hard, even outside of the medical realm, to raise our children, to educate them, to protect them from unsafe and risky behaviors, such as smoking and recreational drug abuse and things like these. However, we refuse blood transfusions not to be confused with we refuse medical care. We want medical care for our children just without blood. So the medical uh, literature uh, supports the safety and the efficacy of non-blood medical management and next slide here. And parents would certainly request that they have skilled and uh, willing physicians. And we also know that when it comes to, to children, uh, that this is uh, difficult for everyone. And so we, we, we do recognize that you may not, or we may not get 100% assurance that blood will not be used. We simply ask this. Please do the very best you can to avoid it. So parents, they desire mutual respect and good communication uh, with, with the visit physicians. So there are times when we help witness parents to understand the, the legal realities uh, that they may face in these situations. And even if a hospital uh, le uh, seeks legal intervention, parents would like to be notified so that at the very least they can have an opportunity to express their wishes uh, on this subject. So many doctors have avoided blood transfusions uh, before these issues, issues occur by considering the following clinical aspects. Uh, the hazards of transfusions, and that was talked about uh, earlier in, in one of the discussions. Um, there's much published uh, medical information on, on the subject, even dealing with uh, children. Uh, judicious clinical management protocols, and we uh, certainly highly uh, recommend to consult uh, experienced physicians who uh, may have uh, dealt with some of our younger uh, witness patients. And then where it becomes necessary, uh, 
the patient may need to be transferred to another physician or even perhaps another facility. And so we find that by following these uh, strategies as possible for law, for ethics, and for medicine to be practiced together. Now, because of the occasional challenges in providing health care for Jehovah's Witnesses, what has our organization done to minimize conflict and to, de and to develop a cooperative relationship with the medical community? Well, we've established um, a network of, uh, a worldwide network, in fact, of, of hospital liaison committees, or as we affectionately call them, uh, HLCs. Uh, our national office in Wallkill, New York, they direct the work of over 140 HLCs in the United States and parts of the Caribbean. Each committee is made up of community-based ministers who knowledgeably interact with physicians and hospital personnel, social workers, and members of the judiciary. And a few of our members are present here uh, with us today. So how can we be a resource to you in helping with the needs of Jehovah's Witness, Jehovah's Witness patients? Well, here are a few ways. We can provide medical articles and other information. We can uh, arrange for a doctor-to-doctor -doctor consultation or referral. Um, we can assist in the transfer of a patient if necessary. Um, we are available 24-7 for patients and clinicians, clinicians, clinicians as well. And uh, we, we cherish the opportunity to stand before you today and make presentations to medical staff, uh, bioethics, and legal personnel. Also, you can contact uh, any of our local members, uh, home phone, cell phone, whatever phone number they have available. And if you would like uh, to have some of our materials, um, I'll, I'll show you in just a few minutes where you can find them and some of the resources we make available to you. So um, much of it is uh, web-based these days, so websites with links to PubMed, journals, clinical papers, uh, peer-reviewed resources, uh, evidence-based summaries. And, and it's good to know that um, although they're contained on our website, it's, it's, uh, the information is from people like yourself. And um, so we really encourage you, if, um, if you haven't had an opportunity to um, look at our uh, website, and it certainly has uh, many uh, subject matters. I'm just going to breeze through a few um, that, that are available, management and optimiza optimization of hemostasis and additional information, me medicine and surgery, uh, cardiothoracic, uh, cardiothoracic and vascular surgery, and it's just a, a plethora of information available on, on the website uh, that we feel will be uh, valuable to you. And so we encourage you to explore the, the, the site, and um, uh, you, you'd be amazed and delighted at, at what information is available to you. Um, printed as well as uh, electronically. So we also uh, produce high quality medical articles that are featured on our web website and, uh, and in citations pro provided by doctors. This uh, clinical evidence details strategies to uh, avoid blood transfusion. And we also distribute the following clinical strategies. And these, doc these documents uh, are designed to manage hemorrhage and anemia without blood transfusion in several key settings. Uh, and they are, as you can see noted, surg surgery, uh, critical care, obstetrics, and gynecology, and GI bleeding. And, and if you had an opportunity, or you will have an opportunity to uh, uh, view these because we left in the back today, there are hundreds of medical articles referencing, detail, referencing uh, details within each document. And many doctors and departments, even here at the University of Maryland, have used these references in treating Jehovah's Witness patients. So the HLC can make these available to you upon request. But as we mentioned today, we did bring a nice supply uh, that's outside in the lobby, and we encourage you to Pick up a copy if you have not already do so, do, do so upon leaving.
So this is the packet um, that, that we've um, brought with us today. So it's illustrated here um, for medical professions and it, pro professionals, and it contains uh, information about our HLCs and a religious and ethical document detailing our position on medical therapy and other topics. Uh, we'll also insert other clinical-based articles and summaries based on the doctor's specialty. So finally, here's the recommended protocol for treating Jehovah's Witnesses. Review relevant blood conservation and transfusion alternative strategies and treat the patient without using donor blood. Consult with other doctors experienced in managing patients without blood transfusion. There are many here at this hospital that have skillfully worked and treated witness patients and others who desire bloodless medicine. Contact the local HLC to locate cooperative doctors at other facilities uh, for consultation on alternative blood transfusions, or alternatives to blood transfusion. Our national office maintains a list of doctors in many specialties who have been treating witness, patient, witness patients for decades, some of whom have published some of the medical articles that you have access to on this subject. And on occasion, doctors here uh, have successfully consulted with some of these doctors as well. And then lastly, transfer the patient if necessary to a cooperative doctor or facility before the patient's condition deteriorates. In your case, many patients are actually being transferred here to your facility. However, there may be situations where you cannot accept the case for one reason or another. We understand that. And if that does happen and the case is critical, Time is of the essence in making this decision. So we trust that this presentation has been informative. We certainly hope it was. And while Jehovah's Witnesses uh, may have presented the medical community with uh, what we know is a medical and ethical challenge, we find that many have met that challenge. And so we remain confident that you will continue to offer a high standard of care which includes the use of your skills to treat patients without blood transfusion. And so we encourage you to please contact us if you have any further questions or uh, obtain it by calling the number on our national, of our national office located on our website. So once again, I'd like to thank you for the, the opportunity uh, to stand before you and make this presentation and have the privilege of presenting this subject to you today. So we're going to turn it back over to Ann, and after which I believe we'll have a little question and answer session. We do have time, a few minutes, for questions and answers for uh, the audience. Uh, Dr. Tanaka, would you mind coming? And Mr. Stafford? I'm sorry, Mr. And Mr. Johnson. Do we have questions? Yes. So autologous stored blood refers to the pre-op donation, so you completely sep you separate the autologous blood from the patient and keep them, say, in the blood bank. So intra-op ANH, essentially we can take the blood, but we can still keep them connected to the patient through IV tubing, so that doesn't separate from the patient. Now, if it's a non-Jehovah's Witness patient, we can always separate. That's an option as well. So, I mean, the difference will be you know, less if it's non-Jehovah's Witness patient. Other questions? Okay, well, thank you all for attending, and I'd really like to thank Dr. Tanaka for his time today and presenting this information, and also um, Mr. Stafford and Mr. Johnson and the members of the Jehovah's Witness community that were here today to support this. I think it's very valuable. I'm glad we have recorded this so that we can put it out for others that were not here today to enjoy the presentation. Thank you all very much. <laughs>